Um, I'm here to tell you a story. It's a bit of a scary story, maybe a bit depressing, but hopefully with some um, moments of hope. So um, let's start. So this story starts for me in the lobby out there at Hacklew 2023. And my boss, um, Patrice, he called me over and the two of us were looking over the screen maybe with less hair than Mulder and Scully. And um, we were looking at a security bulletin from Cisco talking about um, CVE 2023-2198. And um, this bulletin basically said something like, uh, in September, a customer contacted us. We saw some weird behavior on a router they created an admin account, they did some stuff, they deleted it, and we closed the ticket. And then two weeks later, we found a bunch more. And there's an implant, and we don't know how they got in, uh, we're working on it. Please take your admin interfaces off the internet. Um, and actually, this, there was a Cisco Talos blog that went with this security bulletin, and they'd actually analyzed the malware called Bad Candy. And what was interesting is that this implant just had a, a, a web backdoor, basically. And one person, uh, Jacob Baines from Vulncheck, had already started scanning um, the internet for this URL. This was, the bulletin came out on the 16th of October, and he'd started scanning, I think, in the evening of the 17th. And he, when he got to 10,000 compromised Cisco routers, he started communicating because he realized this was a, a big thing. And we saw the same, we saw his messages. And one of the things we do is we scan the internet. We already had a list of Cisco iOS XE devices on the internet. Um, so we started scanning too. When uh, Jacob started uh, communicating, of course, the, uh, the cyber press were all over this. Uh, 10,000 compromised uh, Cisco devices, zero days, and we could tell this was going to be a big story. So, um, so yeah, we ran our first scan, and we got the results on the, the morning of the 18th of uh, October. And there were 80,000 exposed iOS XE devices, and 53,000 of them were compromised. And, um, and because this was like a big story, because it was, you know, in all of the bleeping computer, everyone was talking about it, I was expecting this massive response from the cybersecurity community that we were going to, you know, we were going to be all over this, and within a week, there was just going to be nothing for the adversary to use. But... And you can see we, we scanned a second time just to check our data because we were like 53,000 is really a lot. And then we scanned uh, each day and this number was really going nowhere. This, I mean, by the end of the week that maybe 15,000 out of the 80,000 had been taken off the internet, which is some kind of response, but it's a bit of a small one. Now, before I go any further, I've got a, a surprise for you. I know you'll be excited about. It's because I guess not everyone here is uh, either a cyber unicorn or a network engineer. And so you have a mandatory training now on iOS XE. <laughs> what is it? Um, so from an architecture term, iOS XE is all of the software engineering genius of Cisco iOS running in a daemon service on top of a Linux kernel. And because it's a Linux kernel, it will do everything that a normal Linux box will do. Um, on top of this, Cisco have added stuff. Um, I don't really know what this slide is trying to say, other than attack surface. Um, one thing I have investigated is that it comes with a bunch of APIs for the old iOS daemon. So for example, there's just a Python module. You can just do import iOS, and then there's an iOS object, and you can run commands. You can set config from Python script. Super handy, right? Um, I took this left-hand screenshot from the Cisco marketing site. It says, for the future of work, it's just not your work. It's somebody else's. 
Um, this is a YouTube video where a Cisco engineer um, helpfully shows how you can start a Linux container with a desktop and you can run a Wireshark with a GUI, all with on your Catalyst switch. So red teams, if you're stuck for ideas, next time you know where to look. Um, third module of your mandatory training is hardware. What do iOS XC devices actually look like? So it, you've got everything really from these, the top uh, left-hand corner are what are called ISRs, I think it's integrated services, routers. These are the kind of smaller, still enterprise hardware, but it's the kind of thing a telco would give you for your SD-WAN uh, connection. And it goes all the way up to these um, bigger boxes. The middle thing is an ASR, that's probably what the telco would have at the other end, and you can see redundant power supplies. The command module for this ASR is um, the board there. That's two Xeon processors, 64 gig of RAM, list price of $50,000, excluding tax. And the CBR is the thing on the right. That's a converged broadband router. That's what you need if you want to provide broadband services to a small town. Um, yeah, there's currently 38 of those vulnerable out on the internet. So. Anyway. Um, also, enterprise switches, layer three switches, um, and I've got a bit of s statistics here. So 6% of roughly what's out exposed out on the internet is uh, the big stuff, the ASRs, CBRs. About 19% is these layer three switches, and 75% roughly is the smaller ISR routers. But, I mean, these are still seriously good quality equipment. So... Priority Cyber One Defense Response. Um, I have to say I was disappointed with where this graph was going at the time. But I thought, when I was preparing this talk, I thought, well, maybe, you know, we responded to this on the 18th. Maybe we're just slow, you know, because the Cisco bulletin came out on the 16th. Maybe everyone did all the, the work in those first 48 hours. So I took all the data, all the historical data we had from before the 16th of October, worked out a list of unique IP addresses and compared it with what was after the 18th of October and just calculated how many machines had been unplugged. And I've created the Unplugging Awards 2023 country category. And of course, the US at the top, you guys just, you know, for the win, you know. Um, but special mention to, to China, um, because there's this 91% reduction in the number of exposed devices. That's, that's impressive, guys, really impressive. So, but you can see that everyone else is in the kind of 50% or lower. Um, so let's now look at what the same data, but from an organizational perspective. <laughs> And something interesting appears um, because one of either two things is happening here. Either Chinese telcos have the fastest and most efficient cybersecurity processes on the planet or they got this information before everyone else did. And um, so, you know, I'm not going to draw any hasty conclusions from this data, um, but little hat tip to Amazon for being very, very good at what they do. And um, I guess they have a lot of these kind of routers in sort of customer peering arrangements and things, and they'd removed 81, 82% of them off the internet. Um, special mention to Cisco, while everyone else was unplugging stuff from the internet, they were actually plugging them in trying to get them compromised, um, but the attackers were not having any of that. When you connect with an autonomous system name of Cisco Systems, the attackers were just not compromising those machines, and by the 20th, they'd given up um, and unplugged them all. Um, so about a week later, at the weekend, uh, Cisco made a patch available. So did the attackers. Um, so over the weekend, we saw this thing where these implants basically just disappeared off the internet. Um, and we had a bit of a conversation. I only put this slide up really for two reasons. One is for Robert's take on the situation, which I share. And uh, secondly is uh, creds to Fox IT because they do an amazing job and share some great tools. Um, and they had got their hands on a compromised 
device, and they analyzed the updated backdoor and said, look, it's looking for an authentication header now, but there's this second entry point into the, um, into the web implant that um, I'll talk about a bit uh, later. Um, this slide is really just to say that after like 10 days, um, we'd got the number of compromised, I say we, I mean the cybersecurity community, you know, uh, we'd got the machines, number of compromised machines down from 53,000 to about 38,000. The attackers, they can patch 40,000 machines in a weekend. Um, and it's not just fire and forget for them. Um, I don't know if you noticed on the first graph, but there's this about 3% of machines with that didn't get the first the patch correctly the first time. They came back a week later and fixed that and reinfected some machines that had been rebooted. And, um, and then it happened again. All the web implants dropped off the internet. And, um, and this is my actually most, most hopeful slide because... The second time all the web implants dropped off the internet, um, it was because somebody had been, had been given the uh, order to make this web implant look normal. Just make it so they can't detect it. And, and the, the problem is that in order to do that, you have to write some decent functional specifications. And just like us, they're really crap at that. And so... Um, the developer has obviously got his JIRA ticket and gone, make it look normal. What does that mean? Um, I'll just send them the login page. Um, except on a real device, you don't get a login page. You get a 401 error. And so we can still detect the compromised machines because we hit this percent um, location in the web implant and we get a login page, which is just wrong. So maybe we'll be saved by the fact that it's actually really difficult to do good software engineering and write decent functional specifications. Where does this take us? Well, by the end of the year, it was 20, it was basically, um, yeah, well, you can see the number here, 41,000 exposed interfaces, 20,000 compromised. I was actually thinking maybe, maybe my expectations are too high. Maybe 50% compromised is okay. Um, just to explain the little artifacts in the data, that's because um, we started doing weekly scans where we were taking a new list of Cisco IOS XE devices. So the little peaks there are weekly scans, or more, sometimes a bit more than weekly, but weekly scans where we include new devices and honeypots, whereas the underlying daily scans is the original list of IP addresses from the 18th of October. So anyway, the, but the trend is down here, right? But then we got our second piece of kind of corporate behavior from this uh, threat actor. Um, because new year, new budgets, new objectives. And so, um, yeah, about two weeks into the year, new year, um, they start, launched a new campaign of recompromising devices. And uh, that kind of co trend continued up to the summer. And we were kind of running about two-thirds, between 60 and 70% compromised. Um, this is a pretty dark place, especially if you're the tech lead at Cisco Talos. One like. Yeah. Um, but actually, it gets worse than this. Um, I work with some CSERT colleagues, or ex-colleagues in, um, in France, and... Um, Jérôme from Orange Cert pointed out to me that um, basically the implant stops the machine from um, being exploited a second time. And a proof of concept had come out for this CVE and um, he was like basically some of the machines that are not compromised are still vulnerable. So we started scanning for this uh, this CVE as well as the presence of the implant. And so what you now have is that out of the 18,000 machines that are not compromised, 12,000 of them are still vulnerable. Um, and either the threat actors can't compromise those machines or they don't want to. Um, we're not sure which at this point. Um, 
So let's talk about who might be behind this, what do they want, what are they doing. Um, in the original um, bulletin from Talos, they basically listed all the commands that were run on these machines. And what you can see is that they're not really interested in the victim's network. They're interested in the router. And they're interested in what networks it's connected to upstream. But there was no sign of any attempt to steal credentials, to infect the network. They're just interested in what's the hardware specs of the machine? What's its power configuration? So, um, and maybe the second inf way we can look at this is to um, look at what kind of um, organizations had been compromised. Um, so I took the top 10. This, this is not what you think. This is just the plural of autonomous system. Yeah. AS is, yeah. Um, so I took the top three countries, the top 10 organizations from the top three countries. Because originally I was thinking maybe this is one of these pre-positioning attacks. Um, but, and maybe somebody's building a kill switch to like destroy 25% of the internet or something. I mean, what would happen if you took all these routers offline? Well, what would happen is you'd basically deprive Latin America, about 20% of the US, and a bunch of other countries of broadband services. Uh, these are all tier two operators, ISPs. This is not core internet infrastructure. It's downstream um, and often, so I've done a list of uh, AS names here, but for example, if I take uh, Uninet in Mexico with 2,000 uh, or 3,000 of these things, that's because they've got 3,000 routers, one in each client uh, office, basically one in each customer's location. Um, and so those are the routers that are actually compromised. So it's a, they're in small businesses, um, universities, schools, um, gas stations that haven't exploded. Yeah. Um, and we can compare this to V2 because maybe you noticed there was a few machines in version 2 that hadn't been compromised. And... Um, and if we look at this list, we can see Amazon, Microsoft, more Chinese telcos, um, and special mention to Shadow Server, which in about February, a bunch of devices appeared on their network plugged in in the UAE. They were never compromised either. So the attacker is deliberately excluding these kind of uh, gaffer, uh, organizations or uh, known cyber intelligence operators and targeting these um, sort of tier two operators around the world. And when I mean around the world, I really mean around the world. I haven't found a single country without one of these compromised routers. And I've looked, I've really looked hard. This is aggregated data. You can zoom in at any level and whether it be a Pacific island or a European Grand Duchy, everybody has a compromised Cisco router. So um, let's just summarize who our adversary could be. Um, persisted, motivated, and capable. This kind of corporate behavior, you know, when something doesn't work and it takes a week or two weeks to get a new release, that smells like meetings, you know, smells of corporate meetings, release schedules, clear technical objectives, avoiding these um, well-known, uh, competent <laughs> cybersecurity organizations. And when I did my first version of this talk, that was basically it, right? I mean, you could draw some conclusions with this data, but I was like, I mean, this is why you get an X-Files theme, basically. <laughs> You know, but um, on the 22nd of May this year, um, I got a surprise. Well, it wasn't really a surprise. This is one for the conspiracy theorists. Of course, the truth is out there at Google. And um, Kevin, sorry, uh, Michael uh, Raggi put out this uh, post from Mandiant, and he talks about orb networks. 
And I mean, maybe some of you had already come across this idea of orb networks. I had talked to uh, CSIRT teams and I'd been to conferences where people had talked about, you know, targeted attacks where every single connection came from a different IP address. And if you're going to do that, you need some pretty impressive infrastructure, right? With a big bunch of, uh, of nodes. And well, it turns out that the name for that is an operational relay box network. And um, one, I just pulled out this little quote from this, bo from this uh, blog post because referencing those 12,000 vulnerable but not compromised machines. Um, one of the things that these uh, orb network operators are offering to their customers, the APTs, is the ability to rotate devices into the network and out of the network. So you have a pool, a reserve pool of devices. Um, at least that's my uh, understanding given the evidence that I have. Um, so an orb network is basically a private uh, relay network with entry nodes, exit nodes, and some kind of um, encrypted communication across the middle that makes it easy for an APT operator, uh, an attacker, to launch an attack, and they don't have to worry about their infrastructure being exposed. They just uh, come over, they come at you over this orb network. And in this uh, same um, blog post, um, and I have, reached out to Michael and told him I'm doing this talk. Um, in this Orb 2, in his blog post, he mentions Orb 2, and he specifically cites Cisco uh, devices. And we know this is not Cisco Soho routers because they're in a different Orb uh, bot network. Um, this is actually quite a complicated operation that uses Tor and their, um, and their operational relay box network, um, and they have intelligence that this is used by APT31. So, um, so, well, I will, what can we do about this? Because this is obviously a problem. Well, usual cyber hygiene, um, you know, don't put your admin interfaces on the internet. I'm not going to get into a debate about mandatory patching. I just, this is just my personal opinion that it's necessary because all of these organizations that are compromised, most of them don't have security teams or not what we would call a, a security team. Um, notify the affected organizations. I've done my part. I've done a bit of cleaning up in my environment, in the ecosystem. If you want if you, to help, come and talk to me and I will give you specific data about organizations in your uh, area. Um, anybody, uh, yeah, anyone from Belgium, there's one um, broadband operator in Belgium that needs help. So, <laughs> um, but actually, Cisco already had a solution for this. Um, this is this field uh, announcement for um, cleansing enterprise switches of the implant. Basically, you just plug a network cable into the first port socket and it reboots the, the switch because it's badly designed. And their, um, their solution to this, the um, enterprise-grade solution, is to get a pair of scissors and cut off the rubber boot on your network uh, cable. So thanks, Cisco, for thinking of this in advance. Um, so what are my conclusions? Well, conclusions are that state threat actors based in the PRC, and this is Mandiant's attribution, not mine, but it certainly uh, fits in with the evidence we have that Chinese telcos somehow had advance warning that these machines uh, were going to be, um, or are being, or were being targeted. Um, they've created this competitive services ecosystem for APTs where you know, service providers are competing to provide APTs with the best uh, network service possible. <laughs> so they need high-grade material, redundant power supplies, all the stuff that we put in our, in our infrastructure. And they're providing this dis globally distributed Tor-like network. And their network is stable. It's, you know, it's even growing. I uh, looked up the latest figures and it basically hasn't changed since June. Or if anything, there's slightly more devices. Um, 
and to show that I'm just geopolitically neutral here, it's, um, this is not the first time that Cisco <laughs> devices have been com compromised by APTs, right? This is uh, it's just the first time. It's not the equation group. So um, um, that's my talk. Thank you for the organizers for the opportunity to speak. And if you have been, thank you for listening. Did you know that in China, security researchers are actually, under law, mandated to disclose these vulnerabilities to the government before they can disclose them abroad? Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, I didn't know that, but yeah, this is, uh, yeah. So that might explain the few days to, <laughs> to patch inside yeah. China, at least yeah. contribute. Maybe uh, it's not just an offensive capability. Maybe they use it to actually improve their defensive posture as maybe well. Maybe they also maybe. use it for that. Yeah. Two slides back, did I read... Vendor-driven mandatory patching? That sounds like backdoors to me. <laughs> no, but I... I, I Support legislation for mandatory vendor-controlled patching opt-out? What I'm saying is that those Cisco boxes, 50,000 of them, Should are just going to sit there, compromised mm -hmm. by other countries until they, get, until they die or they get replaced. So I'm interested in any other solutions. So you, you want Cisco centrally to be able to patch them via hard-coded credentials, credentials of some kind, making Cisco an even bigger target for supply chain attacks? Well, I have an iPhone, so... <laughs> I mean, Apple is already doing that, right, with my iPhone. So, you know, it's not, a, it's not an, un, an, an impossible problem. But I, you know... All right, Let, let's see if anyone has questions. Uh, th thanks for the talk. Um, I, I was I, I was curious to about this uh, assumption or hypothesis about this being used for ORP networks. Yeah. Because this is just a small number, tens of thousands, right? So, and you can have you can have the same by subscribing to any recipe provider these days. Residential IP, residential IP providers, yeah. and they have millions of IPs at their disposals for a very small fee. So what would be the advantage for the bad guy to use such a complicated system to, to gain access to these routers as opposed to just use mom and pop's machines which are just there happy to be used for proxy attacks? It, uh, the router is the difference is that it has a lot of bandwidth potentially. Uh, are, are, is there any sign that it could be used for uh, by booters for to launch denial of service attacks and stuff like that? So um, there's been no intelligence about these machines being used for any kind of uh, attack that I can find, right? Um, uh, there's been no mention. These IOCs don't crop up in um, random open source threat lists and things. Um, my understanding of it, it's essentially a question of quality of service, right? These machines have got much more power than a home router. Um, the threat axes have specifically profiled these machines. I mean, the scripts they were looking are uh, returning data like how many CPUs they've got, how many power supplies they've got. So somebody is not just interested in, you know, I've got a node with some bandwidth. They want to know about the actual physical device and what it's capable of. And so when you have a, um, a network with different roles, entry nodes, uh, exit nodes, uh, transit nodes, then with that information you could actually you know, build a system and actually have some kind of guarantee that your devices are going to be able to ensure that, you know, deliver on those roles. Um, I think also, um, it's, uh, it's also, yeah, just a question of, um, this idea that there's a service provider ecosystem. I mean, I, they're actually, they, they want to add value. I know that sounds crazy, but they're not just, you know, reselling some criminal bot network or proxy network. These are, you know, they've built this thing to provide services to their state um, intelligence services, essentially. So they're looking at a higher quality of uh, service 
then you know you're off the shelf uh, home routers and things. That's my understanding of it, and that's um, I think where Mandiant uh, are going with this as well. Yeah. Did you uh, contact some law enforcement about this? Uh, <laughs> Um, sure. I mean, yes. I mean, we've talked to law enforcement in France. Um, I've actually um, worked with a bunch of organizations to identify their compromised machines and clear, the, clear them off. Um, but, yeah, I don't... Law enforcement were like, thank you very much for the information. Yeah. <laughs> You know, we shouldn't speculate, right? But <laughs> sometimes you have to... I can't see... Huh. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm. I was. Uh, I'm particularly interested in in the part you said those those remaining devices that were actually not compromised by this story, but yeah. uh, still remain vulnerable. So, I'm, 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 well, you can only start thinking and imagining and doing some philosophical discussions. You you raise the the topic of the potential why they are not compromised, which is a clearly a legitimate reason if you want to protect the rest of the network. Um, on the other hand. Maybe they could also see it as an opportunity to be in some more interesting networks and with a different perspective, like not building an orb network, but getting access to potentially interesting networks. Have you dug into that topic too? or, or? No, I haven't. I, um, my boss has given me quite a lot of time to prepare this talk, but I haven't investigated beyond um, you know, the fact that these devices are vulnerable. I haven't looked... It would be interesting to do a distribution and see is it just randomly distributed vulnerable or are they vulnerable in specific organizations? I don't know that. Yeah. Um, um, just maybe you've seen, maybe you can tell this, but the background of my slides is the, um, if you exploit the vulnerability, you can actually just run Linux commands. And so this is uname slash a, um, and you actually get the, response from the router with its hardware version, kernel version, and everything, which is why we were able to get the stats for what devices are actually out there on the internet. Yeah. All right, anyone else? Yeah, Eric. Uh, just one question. I see the, uh, two questions. Sorry, I got a show IP OSPF at the beginning. Sorry, very show IP OSPF at the beginning. Yeah. First, first command. I'm surprised they are not checking BGP. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, this is I just copy and pasted from the Cisco Talus blog, okay. and they don't mention BGP. But obviously, they are looking at what the routing environment is around these machines. But yeah, the lack of BGP in a way. Also, I think shows that you know they're not looking to preposition to destroy parts of the internet. They're not really interested in is this part of a big piece of infrastructure. They're just looking more locally at the the environment of the machine. I think. Um, second, super fast. Should we buy a Huawei router instead? <laughs> I'm yeah. I have no opinion on that. Um, um, I, uh, I, I think I think it's weird. What I will say is that uh, I've been trolling Cisco and Talos a little bit about this because they actually organized a conference for iOS XE automation. I think it was in Sydney. And I was like, I hope you've invited the bad candy guys because like... They're really the masters of iOS XE automation. I mean, they're come basically, you know, doing deployments across 40,000 machines across the internet. But I don't get an answer from them. So, but I'm a little bit disappointed that, that I've not heard more about how Cisco are going to actually solve this problem. They're just, you know, they're just carrying on business as normal. So. I, w I wish I didn't have a comment to make because that was a perfect ending note for your talk, the, 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 the trolling there. I think that was fantastic. <laughs> but 
I just have to comment because you, you shouldn't speculate, but I can, I, sometimes I can't help it. What if there was a country which might be included in the Cisco Talos blog, oh sorry, the Mandian blog, that had a geopolitical interest in at some point invading a, a certain island, and when that happened might have a, a geopolitical interest in deceiving, denying, and so on, causing chaos to prevent the response, and managing, controlling a number of Cisco devices around the world might be quite useful at that point to cause confusion. Yeah, I guess there are other use cases for this infrastructure, yeah. <laughs> All right, I think it's time for the morning break. Thank you very much. Thank Be you.